Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. Lots of big stories to get to. Um, first of all, Pelosi and a congressional delegation making an unannounced visit to Kiev. We'll give you those details as well as some uh, big spending the Biden administration is proposing to continue funneling weapons into that country. Uh, Noam Chomsky giving credit to a very, very unexpected person. Uh, so we will play that for you, and we will also react. White House Correspondents' Dinner, a.k.a. Nerd Prom, over the weekend. <laughs> we have all the cringe for you to save you the trouble of having to watch it all for yourself. Also, the stock market, I don't know if you've been paying attention, has been kind of uh, falling all over the place lately. So we'll talk to you about what's going on there, what the Fed moves uh, are likely to be this week. They are meeting once again, so that's very significant for all of us, not just people who happen to have money in the stock market. Elon Musk giving some medical advice. Mm -hmm. Very much upsetting a large group of people. Yes. Break that down for you. And we also have to share with you CNN attempting a little bit of self-reflection. Right. Doesn't get too far, but a no. little bit of self-reflection. Still enjoyable. Um, also, welcoming back to the show, Professor Richard Wolf. He's also going to talk about the economy. We had that surprise drop in GDP last week, so we're excited to talk to him about that. But we wanted to start with Pelosi and that trip to Kiev. Yeah, the Pelosi trip is uh, basically the highest-ranking U.S. official, number three in line to the presidency, who is visiting Kyiv. Let's put this up there on the screen. So uh, Speaker Pelosi met with uh, President Zelensky and his team, bringing along uh, an additional delegation, including Adam Schiff, of all people, uh, on the ground, which makes sense, uh, given that he's the chief Russiagator in all of Congress. But the top-level U.S. congressional delegation there, Pelosi praised the, quote, ferocity and the resolve of the Ukrainians in their face-to-face -face meeting. And more importantly, here's what she says, in terms of a commitment of U.S. policy from the branch of Congress. Quote, our commitment is to be there for you until the fight is done. Quote, we are on a frontier of freedom. Your fight is a fight for everyone. Thank you for your fight for freedom. You all are welcome, Zelensky apparently told the delegation. So, yeah, I'm not sure what else he would say. But I think that it is a important declaration because we've pointed as much as we can to the president. Obviously, he has mostly unilateral action, but he still has to submit these funding requests and more to Congress. And it just goes to show you the immense bipartisan support, both in the speaker and leader McConnell and others, that they have not only for the Biden administration policy in Ukraine, but if anything, they want a more hawkish policy, Crystal. Correct. Yeah. So um, this delegation happened to be all Democrats. But right. as you accurately point out, most of the sentiment around Ukraine has been wholly bipartisan with very, very, very few dissenting voices or even voices just saying like, hey, let's slow down and think about mm -hmm. what we're doing here uh, for a minute. Ilan Omar famously, you know, said, why don't we slow down and think about some of these sanctions and everything that we're doing and so indiscriminate and was completely, um, completely smeared for having the audacity to do such a thing. To your point about how, you know, a lot of members of Congress went even more than what the Biden administration has done. You had Democrat Representative Jason Crow of Colorado, uh, a veteran and a member of the House Intelligence and Armed Services Committee, saying that he went to Ukraine with three areas of focus, weapons, weapons and weapons. There you go. I think it also uh, bears pointing out that even though, yes, the fight has largely moved to eastern Ukraine, making Kyiv more safe, this is still not without risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, the UN Secretary General recently met with Zelensky in Kyiv just last Thursday, and a missile strike rained down on the capital barely an hour after their joint press conference. So probably Russia trying to send a, you know, kind of a middle right. finger there. But again, just to point out that these trips into an active war zone still not without risk, and in my opinion, you know, rather ill-advised, continuing to be rather ill-advised, given the fact that, you know, if you had a member of Congress who was injured in an attack, if something, God forbid, were to happen, mm -hmm. what that would mean in terms of an escalation is, is very clear. I mean, it would be a complete disaster. You'd be facing a hot war directly with Russia and likely, you know, nuclear attacks and all of that, that entails. So I continue to think that these missions to demonstrate our solidarity and that we're really with their cause are rather ill-advised. Yeah, and I think that there's, you know, it really bears where people will say, well, oh, well, Churchill visited, you know, the French in the middle of the Battle for France. Yeah, the UK was at war with Nazi Germany. Right. We're not at war with Russia. So right. by going into an active and a hot war zone, you're putting the United States and its policy at risk as much as a nice, you know, show of support might mean. I don't know why I can't meet in a more neutral country, like right across the border, in a NATO country, actually. It'd be 
company, probably far more advisable. But all of this is on the heels of, and let's put this up there on the screen, Joe Biden now asking Congress for $33 billion more in additional aid to Ukraine, as they even describe it here in the Western press, a quote, dramatic escalation of U.S. funding for U.S. war with Russia, for the war with Russia, and the Ukrainian president is pleading with lawmakers to give it a swift approval. So here's what it says. $20 billion for weapons, ammunition, and other military assistance. $8.5 billion in direct economic assistance to the other Ukrainian government, and then $3 billion in humanitarian aid. And it always makes me sad whenever I read these appropriations, and I just look at 20 billions in weapons and ammo. I'm not saying the Ukrainians don't need weapons and ammo, but we have some, what, 5 million or so displaced people? We need to be actually probably spending a hell of a lot more on the humanitarian response in order to make sure that these people are taken care of. NATO obviously stepped up and so has the European Union, but it always, you know, everybody says, like, show me what your priorities are by pointing to what you actually fund. And right, right now, the funds are all towards the war with Russia and specifically on the behalf of the Ukrainian military to wage war on that military. I'm not saying that isn't uh, obviously a priority, but it just shows you that we have no real hope for anything else within the conflict and no strategy to try and bring this thing to an end and find peace. Well, that's it. We know what the macro strategy is because they've said what mm -hmm. the macro strategy is. It isn't to negotiate a peace. It isn't to try to provide Russia with an off-ramp and bring them to the table. Not at all. I mean, they've now explicitly stated what people at the beginning would have been accused of being like, you know, pro-Russia and conspiracy theorists, et cetera, if they came out and said, no, we think the U.S. policy is actually to weaken and ultimately try to push Putin out of power. Well, now that's effectively the stated po policy of the United States. And so this massive increase in uh, weapons funding for Ukraine should be seen as part of that strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, when they, they want to keep Russia tied up in Ukraine forever. That's not good for the world. It's not good ultimately for Ukraine. And so that's how you should view this policy. And, you know, we throw these big numbers around here. It can sort of like be hard to wrap your head around how much money exactly this is. But this this full package, just this piece of it, represents 20% of Ukraine's entire GDP. There you go. Okay, so that's that's the size and the scope of what we're ultimately contemplating here. Again, with, you know, I'm, I'm, I would expect that this will likely sail through. The only potential legislative hiccup is Democrats are consider, considering tying it to COVID aid, in okay, which case, yeah, that's then the Republicans, the policy. exactly, yeah. <laughs> then the Republicans will be like, I don't know if I yeah. want to do COVID aid too. But in terms of this specific package, I think it has overwhelming bipartisan support. You're likely to see, I mean, you may not see a single voice speak up against it or even offer a a word of caution about what exactly our policy is and what exactly we're doing here. Yeah, I think that's, you know, really, really well said. And if you want to know the other insanity in Congress, this is the poll of power, which gets no scrutiny by the press. Put this up there on the screen. Representative Adam Kissinger saying, words matter, but so do our actions. I'm introducing an authorization of use of military force as a clear red line so that POTUS can take appropriate action if Russia uses chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. We must stand for humanity and we must stand with our allies. So what he's saying is that Representative Kissinger wants to create an authorization for the use of military force for the U.S. to be explicitly allowed by Congress in order to declare war on Russia if it uses biological chemical weapons in Ukraine. Now, that seems completely nuts. I'm not saying that that wouldn't be a horrific act, but should that trigger a potential nuclear war with Russia? That's what Representative Kissinger is saying. I mean, this is somebody who has pushed the no-fly zone and more. Look, the no-fly zone is off the table for now, but don't sleep on these efforts because the media is not looking at this and reporting it with the level of scrutiny that it really deserves. Same with the Pelosi trip. I mean, it's like it's just a foregone conclusion that the number three in line to the presidency is going to just waltz into an active war zone. Yeah. And to put it in perspective for everybody, I really think that we need to look at the level of aid that we've been giving to Ukraine in the context of history. Put this up there on the screen, please, which is that we are now providing Ukraine more money than the U.S. has sent all but four countries in total since 1946. <laughs> so look at this. Wow. Israel, $132 billion. Afghanistan, $111 billion. Egypt, $79.9 billion. Iraq, 
67 billion. Keep in mind, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, we basically ruined. So, you know, that level of aid is not really Occupied commiserate with destroyed, yeah. do- domestic, or it's not really commiserate with like our foreign aid. That is where Ukraine now ranks on the map, more than Pakistan, more than Vietnam, more than Jordan, more than Turkey, which is a NATO ally, more than Russia, ironically enough, and more than India, also an Indo-Pacific ally to the United States. Just consider it within that level of context. And we're not saying the Ukrainians don't deserve help. Of course they do. God bless them. Their cause is righteous. But when runaway military aid like this happens, we have seen this story before with Libya, with Syria, and more. When you have just free, like, floating weapons all over a war zone, stuff changes hands. I mean, it's conceivable that some of this aid will find its way. Even, you know, let's say it gets captured by the Russians, and then they start giving it to Chechens, and then they start using it elsewhere, either at home or even, you know, against the Ukrainians or, God forbid, against somebody else. Else. It's just always a consideration when you're providing massive amounts of military and ammunition into a hot war zone. War is messy, and sometimes those weapons go missing, as the Pentagon likes to say. Well, I mean, we know that there are fringe extremist elements within the Ukrainian fighting force. There I mean, we know that, yeah. right? That's, you know, and so we have been to this play before. We've been there in Afghanistan arm- right. arming the Mujahideen. We've been over this a million times. I think the most important thing is to consider the macro policy and the foolishness and ultimately destructiveness of that macro policy of saying, we don't actually want peace. What we want is to keep Russia in a stalemate, um, to weaken and bleed them and you know kill as many Russians in Ukraine as we possibly can in hopes that Putin is put under enough pressure and frankly that the population of Russia suffers enough that they put that pressure onto Putin to remove him from power. That's the clear policy of the United States. You know, when we talk about regime change, it's not necessarily like we're going into Russia to invade. No, I don't think that is on the table whatsoever. But the idea is the U.S. finds it politically useful to have Russia tied up in a long war in Ukraine. Is that good for the Ukrainians? Ask yourself that ultimately. Right. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.